Okay, the next item of business is a debate on motion 11537 in the name of Emma Roddick on championing disability equality and human rights. I'd invite members wishing to participate in the debate to press the request to speak buttons and I invite uh, Emma Roddick to speak to and move the motion. Minister, around 13 minutes, please. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Um, I'm very glad to, to be here uh, speaking to this motion because it is an important time of year for us to mark for, for many reasons. Um, firstly, we are just five days away from the 75th anniversary of the signing of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, uh, which set out for the first time fundamental human rights to be universally protected. We have just marked the International Day of Disabled People, the theme of which was united in action to rescue and achieve the sustainable development goals for, with and by persons with disabilities. And as many people of faith and none celebrate various holidays and events this time of year, it is a good opportunity to reflect on where we are as a society, as humans across the world, and how we are delivering on our principles and supporting people who have less than we do. Creating that fairer and more equal society is a priority for this government. We know that a fairer Scotland can only be realised when we secure equal rights for everyone, when your age, disability, ethnicity, sexual orientation, gender identity, uh, religion and family and socioeconomic status do not decide the course of your life for you or present you with barriers and prejudice. And despite great steps forward, we know that disabled people in many areas of life are often furthest from having their rights realised. The core principles of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights include that human rights are universal and inalienable. They belong to everyone equally. We are all free and equal in dignity and rights. Now, dignity is a familiar word to disabled people, from that perception that requiring support is undignified to suggestions that showing any kind of vulnerability, be it social or medical, means that you are not living with dignity. So much pressure is placed on people to present a certain way, mask feelings and pain, and suffer in silence. As a disabled person, I know how strong we often are, because we've had to be. I know how often we've been ignored because we're often easy to be ignored. And I know how much work is needed across the board, not just to improve the visible practical issues that we face, but to undo the systemic inequality that stacks everything up against us. Not only do we face discrimination and prejudice in the workplace, we have to listen as Conservatives down south suggest that disabled people only have value as human beings if they are able to work that relying on social security, which keeps many disabled people alive, is somehow a failure of character. The changes to work capacity assessments proposed by the Tories concerns us greatly because we know this would lead to people with long-term health conditions or people who are disabled being at risk of benefit sanction. The Cabinet Secretary for Social Justice wrote to her counterpart in the UK Government on the 2nd of October to seek assurance that any changes would be evidence-based and in the interests of those that they're there to support. Research from the DWP itself, though, has found that the move from legacy benefits to universal credit has resulted in more and more disabled people being subject to sanctions, including those who are wait waiting for work capability assessments. We are opposed to this widespread use of sanctions. It is clear that they do not work. However, the vilification of disabled people and the message that's being sent that they're of less worth than others and that harm done to our community by welfare cuts is some kind of necessary evil continues to show up again and again. It betrays a view of disabled people that is inaccurate and degrading. Tressa Burke, certainly. Alex Hamilton. I'm very grateful indeed for the Minister giving way, and I don't disagree with anything she said thus far in an excellent speech. Does she agree with me that we, the best gold standard we have for protecting the rights of people with disabilities is actually enshrined in the United Nations Convention on the Rights of People with Disabilities? And given that this is the week that we reconsider our attempts to incorporate the UNCRC into law, what steps will her government take to do something similar with the UNCRPD? Minister. It's, it's an excellent point, and uh, the member will be aware that the UNCRPD is one of the four treaties that we're seeking to incorporate into Scots law as part of our forthcoming Human Rights Bill, which, which I will get on to talk about shortly. 
Um, Tressa Burke uh, at the Disability Summit uh, held a week and a half ago uh, from the Glasgow Disability Alliance. She noted the recent comments by the UK Government uh, on disabled people working from home and very rightly pointed out that currently there aren't many work at home opportunities available to disabled people. Now, we see things differently in Scotland. We reject the notion that everyone is able to work and that those who can't or haven't received the support that they need in order to don't deserve help from the government. We also accept that many disabled people can work, want to work, but changes are needed to open up the job market uh, to them. While employment law remains reserved to the UK Government, we use our fair work policies to promote fairer work practices across the labour market in Scotland. Uh, this includes our Fair Work Action Plan, which takes an intersectional approach to minimise structural, structural barriers that disabled people, racialised minorities and women in particular face. The Action Plan also reinforces the Scottish Government's ambition to at least halve the disability employment gap by 2038, from the 2016 baseline of 37.4 per cent. We work closely with disabled people and their representative organisations to ensure that their voices and experiences help shape our policy and the actions that we take to meet our ambitions. Through a combination of locally designed services like No One Left Behind and our National Employment Service Fair Start Scotland, we are delivering all-age, person-centred, tailored employability services, including in-work support to those furthest from the labour market. This includes disabled people. Certainly. Oliver Mandel. Um, I thank uh, the Minister for taking the intervention. That is not the feedback I often get from young people in my own constituency. Those living in rural areas find these programmes very hard to access. And good services that are there that have cross-party support, like the usual place in Dumfries, do not meet the criteria to get funded. Is that something she would look at again? Minister. Um, certainly, and I know the, the members asked me very recently about this service in particular. I am more than happy to, to reach out and, and speak again about what, what is happening. Obviously, our, our Qualities and Human Rights Fund and indeed the whole budget is, is under review at the moment, so um, we will always work and see what more can be done to achieve the, the shared ambitions that we have. So the services that we do have are entirely voluntary and, of course, have no threat of benefit sanction. The cost of living crisis, COVID, inflation, these things impact on everyone and every government in the country. Where equality comes into play is that the impact is not the same or felt the same by everyone due to systemic issues. Both last year and this, we've allocated almost £3 billion to support policies which tackle poverty and protect people as far as possible from the cost of living. That includes our £30 million insecurity fund, tripled this year, and our new winter heating payment, which is targeted to low-income households, including those with a disabled adult or with responsibility for supporting a disabled child. We have invested almost £2.7 billion into our adult disability payment, which replaces PIP in Scotland. And from the beginning, we were committed to delivering a benefit which was centred on treating people with dignity, fairness and respect. From keeping assessments in-house and compassionate to not using brown envelopes to write to people in receipt of ADP, disabled people co-designed the system with us. In the Scottish system, nobody is subject to the DWP-style assessments or degrading examinations, and we never use the private sector to carry out health assessments. Social Security, yes, sure. Paul King. I'm very grateful to the Minister for taking the intervention. Would she, however, recognise the significant challenges in terms of delays to administering um, ADP, uh, wait times and challenges to actually get through to Social Security Scotland to get the right support and advice that people need? Minister. Absolutely. And I would point out that, that Social Security Scotland has taken urgent action um, around decision making to, to speed it up. And in the last quarter, we processed the highest number of applications since the benefit launched. That was almost 55 per cent more than the previous three months. Um, and from April to July, the, the median average pro processing time reduced by, by eight working days. And we know that some people are still waiting too long and speeding up those processing times remains a, an urgent priority. So I will reassure the member and, and anybody out there who has applied that eligible people will have their payments backdated because we know disability costs money. From care to the often named disability tax that is applied on simple adaptions and, and household items for disabled people, disability benefits are vital to keeping people safe and well. 
Our funding to support people with energy bills recognises the extra energy costs that being disabled often creates and how much more at risk many people are from having to self-ration their energy. For some, it means putting on an extra jumper, putting on the slow cooker, being quite uncomfortable, and for others, it can take years off your life. That disabled people can access our winter heating payment and the fuel insecurity fund is so important for that reason. And that's why we need to increase awareness of these difficulties across government, across public bodies, so that when we look at where to focus spending, we do so with disabled people's needs and priorities at heart. In my role as Minister for Equalities, I of course work very closely with disabled people's organisations who play such an important role in championing uh, disabled people's rights across Scotland and keep the government right on disability competence. I'm currently working with them to develop and implement an immediate priorities plan, which will deliver actions to help tear down those barriers faced by disabled people, focusing on the things that need to change immediately if any future strategies and plans are going to have the impact that we need. It has never been a given that disabled people's voices are at the core of decisions about disabled people. It still is not. Many people still try to speak for us, and so I recognise that importance of continuing to work with DPOs and putting lived experience at the heart of decision-making. Nothing about us without us. But that we will always be fighting against the tide if we can't pull society forward, create that human rights culture, and to steal a line from the LGBT poet laureate, make equality fact. That is why it is so important that within our forthcoming Human Rights Bill, we will be incorporating the UN Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities into Scots law as far as possible within devolved competence. Scotland has the potential to be a world leader in human rights, both in the implementation and realisation of them. And we're doing that in, a, in an extremely difficult context, a context where the UK government is trying to roll back on those very same inalienable rights. The Scottish Government strongly opposed proposals to replace the Human Rights Act with a Bill of Rights. And the Lord Chancellor's decision in June not to proceed with that regressive Bill of Rights Bill was widely welcomed across the political spectrum, but there are still serious and legitimate concerns about the UK Government's current trajectory. Suella Braverman advocates withdrawing from the European Convention on Human Rights. Now, she has been sacked, yes, but her views are shared by many others in the UK Government. And of course, it is also International Human Rights Defenders Day on the 9th of December. Now, as a Scottish Government, we wholeheartedly support the work being done by human rights defenders. As we see breaches across the globe, it is always important and serves as a great reminder, certainly now, to stand up for human rights and challenge when they are not being met and not take for granted that they will always be there. The Scottish Human Rights Defender Fellowship is funded by the Scottish Government and delivered by the University of Dundee. The fellowship enables human rights defenders in difficult conditions from other countries to spend several months in Scotland where they can rest but also continue their work, further develop their skills and expand their networks in a place of safety. Just as the Universal Declaration of Human Rights was not the final step towards universal realisation of those rights, our bill will not be the end of our journey. It is an important and big step which will then require the right effective implementation and work on behalf of people across society, across public, private, third sectors, and the intangible acceptance of a human rights culture from everyone in Scotland. It will not give disabled people equality overnight. Nothing could. But it will give us the chance to educate people about what their rights are, provide them with routes to justice when they're not being realised. It will force duty bearers to treat us with dignity, fairness and respect, creating that structure that allows potential for equality. And it will send a message that Scotland is a place where everyone matters. I hope that MSPs from all parties will join us when that bill is passed in being part of that movement and part of the campaign to educate on and ensure rights. I am really looking forward, presiding officer, to this debate because I know there are people in every party here who care deeply about human rights for disabled people, including many disabled people themselves. And it was only two Saturdays ago that this chamber was full of disabled people and our allies for the first summit to mark the International Day of Disabled People. And that was a wonderful feeling. And, presiding officer, I hope that today is a similar show of solidarity. And while we may disagree on the finer points of implementation and perhaps who's most to blame for rights not currently being met, 
I am sure that today will also offer a chance for all parties to be united in agreement on the need to uphold and progress human rights for disabled people. Thank you. Thank you, Minister. Uh, can I just check that the Minister has moved her motion? I move the motion, my name. Thank you. Uh, I now call on Miles Briggs to speak to and to move Amendment 11537.1. Mr Briggs. Uh, thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer, and my apologies for delay attending the Chamber before uh, business started. I wanted to open today's debate with the words of Natasha Hamilton, and Duke's daughter, who gave evidence to the Scottish Covid inquiry last month. Natasha told the inquiry how she did not have a chance to say a final goodbye to her mother, as she was, and I quote, waiting her turn while her father and sister were in Anne's room. Even though the family knew Anne was hours away from passing, Natasha wasn't able to enter the care home until a certain point. Natasha told the inquiry, I had to take a CPR COVID test. I got to my mum's room, I opened the door and my dad was frantic and I looked at my sister and my sister just nodded at me. I'd missed being with my mum by seconds because we had to stagger who was coming into the care home. Presiding officer, as campaigners have said, arguably the practices which were put in place during the pandemic were far worse than the virus itself in denying many elderly and vulnerable Scots the comfort of their loved ones in their final hours of their lives. Throughout the pandemic and since, I've worked and supported families who want to tell their own stories. And I want to take the opportunity uh, to pay tribute to Anne's husband, Campbell Duke, and daughter, Natasha Hamilton, for the campaign which they have led to see Anne's law put in place, to ensure people living in care homes have the legal right to visits from loved ones and that shared care decision-making, if in any case we see further restrictions having to be put in place. And it has become common for ministers and officials to use lines about, about taking a human rights-based approach. And we across this chamber agree with that in responding to questions and also discussing future policy development. But we really need to see at the heart of policy what that means. And I wanted to look at some of the, the evidence which the COVID inquiry has been told and where that wasn't the case. Because care home residents were neglected and were left, in many cases, uh, to starve because of restrictions imposed during the COVID pandemic. Today's debate is not about the Scottish Government's handling of the pandemic, but the lessons around human rights, which we should make sure we learn. Because, and it, this hasn't been mentioned, but six in 10 people who died with COVID-19 in Scotland were disabled people. And I want to open the debate this afternoon by returning to the decisions taken during the pandemic. Because three, we, three years on from uh, the restrictions being put in place, many of the people in care homes are not alive today, those who lived through the pandemic. And the stories and experiences which their families and friends want to make sure is never forgotten is something we should always be bringing our discussions around human rights policy back to. Like the case of my constituent, Mr Roger Lane, who against the wishes of his family had his power of attorney overruled he was transferred from Midlothian Community Hospital to a care home. Mr Lane developed coronavirus and died from it. And his daughter, Gail, has said that she'll never be able to forgive them for her dad. Someone needs to be held accountable. Now, as part of SNP Minister's COVID-19 response, 1,090 additional care home places were purchased. And patients were, in many cases, moved without the decision, shared decision-making of their families. I, Mr Briggs, sorry, could you resume your seat for just a second? I, mean, I find your speech very interesting. I, I'm looking at the amendment that was selected, although not yet moved. And I, and I do note that there are the references in the amendment pertaining to the title of the government's debate on, specific, on particularly uh, disability and disabled people. And I was wondering if the member was intending to address those points in his speech? Yeah, I, I absolutely am. And these cases are individuals um, who have had complex needs and care needs during uh, the pandemic. And, and the first line, or in, indeed, of my amendment makes this, this very point around investigations during failings of the pandemic around human rights. And that's something I think is important that we do consider uh, today. Another constituent of mine um, who also has raised their concerns and specifically around um, human rights breaches um, was my constituent Heather Goodair who had a do not attempt cardio resuscitation notice placed on her um, while during her stay in hospital. 
She did not discover this until she'd left hospital and found it buried within her notes. Her daughter, Roseanne, had refused to sign a do not resuscitate order when she was first asked to when her mother was admitted to hospital. Now, campaigners are raising these concerns because they want our human rights legislation in Parliament to make sure that these vulnerable patients across Scotland do not face uh, these practices in the future. And I have raised these with former First Ministers, current First Ministers, because I don't think we have seen the full investigation by government into these practices taking place during the pandemic. And there are many, many examples of where ministers, I think, need to look at these arguably breaches of human rights in Scotland during the pandemic. Now, people and their, look at having their care packages suspended um, are also in the area we need to look at. Young people with disabilities having their independent support packages removed or cut um, and having to, remove, uh, having to move home with their elderly parents. The government motion for, today debate, for today's debate states that Parliament notes the ambition for Scotland to be a world leader in both legislation and the realisation of human rights. And I agree, but we need to take this opportunity to consider the consequences of a pandemic and human rights violations. Deputy President Officer, last Sunday marked United Nations International Day of Persons with Disabilities, and the day aims to promote the rights and well-being of persons with disabilities in all spheres of society and development, and to increase awareness of the situation of persons with disabilities in every aspect of political, social, economic and cultural life um, across the world. The disability employment gap in Scotland remains too high, and I think we all recognise that. Um, in 2022, it was 31.9%. Um, percentage points, with 82.5% of non-disabled people in employment compared to 50.7% of disabled people. Now, the government motion today notes the recent consultation on the Human Rights Bill and incorporation um, to incorporate uh, economic, social, cultural rights um, into Scots law. And I think there is cross-party welcome of that opportunity. Many colleagues across the chamber have looked to undertake where they can bring forward their own bills in this area. And I'd note um, particularly uh, Pam Duncan Glancy and Jeremy Balfour uh, for their work they've done on private members' bills to do just that and to advocate and advance uh, rights for disabled uh, people in Scotland. Ministers do not seem to want to engage necessarily with opposition parties' bills on this. And I hope today we'll present an opportunity for ministers to think again on that, because I know members outside of the government, SNP and Green benches, do want to see progress and are doing this themselves with private members' bills in Parliament, but have not had the engagement from government who maybe don't need the numbers, but I think there are ideas from across this chamber which government are missing. And as the Scottish Human Rights Commissioner Director, um, Jan Savage, stated, the Scottish Government have not done enough to ensure disabled people's human rights are fully realised, and we are pushing for protection of disabled people's rights to employment, independent living, and adequate standard of living as well. So I hope the, the Minister, um, in relatively new role, will take on board the opportunity with other members at uh, private members' bills. Um, Deputy Presiding Officer, I want to close um, with a bill which I brought to Parliament in the last session, that was Frank's Law, the extension of free personal care for those under 65. Parliament united and helped to deliver that, um, but we still need to see many councils follow through to deliver that policy in full. Scottish, I hope the Scottish Government can choose to work with Parliament to make progress on all these issues of human rights in this session, and that we will also see Government work to fully deliver Anne's Law as I outlined earlier, and also Callum's law, to look specifically at young people in dis disabled services and, and some of the work which Daniel Johnson um, is doing on a private member's bill. To conclude, evidence and experience shows that when barriers to inclusion are removed for people with disabilities, they are empowered to fully participate in our society and our entire community's benefit. Barriers faced by persons with disabilities are therefore a detriment to society as a whole and accessibility is necessary to achieve progress and development for all. I hope today's debate gives us an opportunity to look at many of the things which still need to change in Scotland and I move the amendment in my name. Thank you. Thank you, Mr Briggs. And I now call on Paul O'Kane to speak to and to move amendment 11537.2. Mr O'Kane. 
Uh, thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. And I'm pleased to have uh, the opportunity uh, to participate in this debate and speak about the experience of disabled people in Scotland so soon after the International Day of Persons with Disabilities. And I think it is important that we take time in this chamber to continue to highlight, engage and support um, everyone uh, who has a disability in Scotland, ensuring that we continue to move towards a future where we continue to tear down the barriers faced uh, by disabled people. And I want to add my voice to thanking parliamentary staff and all MSPs involved with the events in Parliament to mark that International Day, particularly the organisation of the summit on the 25th of November. Uh, bringing more disabled people into their Parliament keeps that spotlight very firmly on the issues and compels all of us to refocus our efforts on the ambition for Scotland to be a world leader in human rights and disability equality. And the first line of the government motion calling for ambition is where I think there is a clear consensus today. But I, I do struggle a little uh, in the rest of the motion to see the scale of action that is required uh, to hear uh, what dis disabled people are telling us and to act uh, accordingly. And at this point, uh, Deputy Presiding Officer, I will refer colleagues to my register of interest as a member of Enable Scotland and a former member of staff. In September, prior to the programme for government, disabled people's organisations wrote to the First Minister calling for clear action to support disabled people, to lift them out of poverty and to ensure that disabled people are involved in the development of policy that has a huge impact on their everyday life. The letter said, and I quote, a lack of focus and attention combined with no accountability or political leadership and a genuine gap in disability competence politically and in your government, uh, referring to the First Minister, has resulted in disabled people and our DPOs feeling dehumanised and deprioritised. And the Scottish Human Rights Commission has starkly highlighted the scale of the challenges in saying that there is an, and I quote, an implementation gap between intentions and good law and policy. And the Scottish Independent Living Coalition have concluded, and I quote again, that the situation for disabled people overall in Scotland uh, has not got any better since their 2016 uh, inquiry. So those are very serious comments indeed, and I think they are hardly uh, ringing endorsements of action in this area. So I do think we have to very clearly reflect on those and think about how we will act accordingly. And of course, I recognise uh, from the government's motion uh, that they have reopened the Independent Living Fund, although in a phased way. Uh, and I don't think that that action alone is enough. And I think organisations have been quite clear that they want to see a full reopening and a, a full resourcing of that uh, intervention in order to make the progress they would hope to see. And as we've heard referred to already this afternoon, less than two weeks ago, uh, the Government voted against the Members' Bill brought by my colleague Pam Duncan Glancy to support disabled young people into adulthood. And that bill was supported by many disability advocacy groups. Uh, and indeed, uh, I think we had quite a strong debate in the Chamber about the landscape and what needs to change more broadly in Scotland. Indeed, the Minister for Children and Young People in Keeping the Promise in her opening said, we absolutely recognise that at the moment too many disabled young people are not getting the support they need. And she went on to reaffirm that in her closing, saying that it's clear that the current situation in respect to disabled young people's experiences of their transitions need to improve. And as I said previously, we spoke about a cluttered landscape in that debate and a lack of policy interventions to improve access to support, particularly that non-residential care support. So given what Ms Don has said, we do have to ask ourselves who has had the power to change these things over 16 years and, and the responsibility for that has been at the door of this government. The government has had that opportunity to deal with that cluttered landscape and to make those uh, policy interventions that, that would have the most impact. Indeed, I reflect, uh, Deputy Presiding Officer, on the Feely Review published two years ago, um, brought forward with a strong suite of recommendations yet to be implemented, a manifesto commitment from the government not implemented. They have promised an immediate priorities plan. They said that that would be published in June. It wasn't. And we have been repeatedly promised a national transition strategy uh, since it was included again in a 2016 manifesto, and that has now been pushed back to the end of next year. So, Deputy Presiding Officer, these repeated delays and failures to act on promises to disabled people are hardly a strong demonstration of the progress on the aspirations which are laid out in the government's motion. So I think uh, we on this side of the chamber are very clear 
uh, about our desire to see bolder action and quicker action from the government to deal with the issues that disabled people and the organisations who support them uh, and advocate for their rights uh, raise with us, uh, with us all. Uh, and we, are, um, we were pleased in the Conservative Amendment to see those references to Frank's law, Callum's law uh, and Anne's law. Um, I think they are, as we've heard already, pieces of legislation or proposals for legislation which do uh, draw support from across the chamber. Uh, the challenge very often, I think, is about the implementation and delivery of uh, many of these things and ensuring um, that progress is made that will have that impact on people's lives that we would all want to see. And um, I was reflecting about all of those pieces of legislation or proposals, and very often they come to this parliament by way of disabled people themselves campaigning or their relatives and um, friends campaigning uh, with them to make that change. And uh, just uh, a few months ago, I was outside of this place with people from across the chamber um, with a, a group of um, disabled people calling for action on non-residential care charges as part of that Feely uh, recommendation that I refer to. And they were very clear that um, they cannot wait for that action and they are frustrated by the lack of action from the government in order to move that, uh, that agenda forward. Because crucially, uh, those are the sorts of things that give uh, people who have a disability independence and the freedom to choose um, what they want to do in their own lives and when they want to do it. So I do think it is a real shame that um, much of this is missing from the government's motion and that we are still waiting for uh, a large uh, range of support and uh, intervention on all of these um, proposals. Uh, in drawing to a conclusion, uh, Deputy Presiding Officer, ultimately uh, we want to see ambition on human rights. We want to see ambition on disability equality. Uh, on this side of the chamber, we will always work for the furthering of both wherever we can. But unfortunately, after 16 years of this government, I think there has been a failure to show tangible action towards uh, either of those ambitions. Um, I hope that we will hear uh, more detail in the debate uh, in terms of people's uh, own experiences. And I hope that the Minister will be able to respond to much of what I have said in her summing up. And this debate will continue, but I will move the amendment in my name. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Kidd, and I now call Alex Wilhamilton. Thank you very much indeed, uh, Presiding Officer. Um, I'm very grateful to the Government for bringing forward this motion today. Um, when I think back to my time as convener of the organisation known as For Scotland's Disabled Children, and we have travelled a great distance, and I, don't, I do recognise the goodwill both in the Minister's remarks and the Government's intent, but our legislation is only good, as good as the implementation behind it, and that is often where legislation falls down. I'll come on to that. As I said in my intervention to the Minister, this is a timely debate, not least as it comes the same week that we debate a legislative reconsideration of our attempts to incorporate the United Nations Convention of Rights of the Child into Scots law. I know that those disabled people watching our proceedings this afternoon will also have watched on as we take steps to incorporate that convention into law with a hunger and as a desire for us to follow it with the incorporation of the UN Convention on the Rights of People with Disabilities. And I am gratified by the Minister's restated commitment to that end and her timeline for doing so. Disabled people matter. Their rights matter. So it matters a great deal that we do all that we can to include them in our society in every possible way, that we take steps in this place to see people with disabilities prosper, to achieve their potential, and not by act of either omission or by commission, make their lives harder than they already are. But sadly, so far, in many ways, we are still missing the mark. The Scottish Government's Equality Evidence Finder reported that in 2018, the employment rate for disabled people was 45% compared with 81% for those of us without a disability. That, re that represents a huge disparity in employment. It comes as no surprise then that rates of poverty are far higher for households in which somebody is living with a disability compared to those where no one is disabled. In fact, half of those in poverty live in a household with at least one disabled family member. And let's bear in mind that people with disabilities, of course, sometimes have additional strains on their budget. For example, due to reliance on assistive technologies, higher fuel bills, higher electricity costs, and other essential expenses. That poverty that they face, too, can often mean that people are not able to meet their most basic needs due to having a disability. It's just not humane. 
I will certainly give way to Martin, Martin Whitfield. Whitfield. I'm very grateful to Alex Cole Hamilton to give way on that point. And isn't one of the stark statistics about this relates to the Trussell Trust food banks, where three out of four users have, um, have a household that contains a disabled adult or child? Alex Cole Hamilton. I think something is fundamentally wrong in our provision, in our safety net that we would seek in this place to provide families affected by disability if such a disproportionate number of them have to rely on food banks. And in August this year, the Scottish Human Rights Commission said that the Scottish Government hasn't done enough to support the human rights of people with disabilities. In a report to the UN, the Commission also raised concern about what it calls a crisis, their word, a crisis for disabled people's rights. Their Executive Director, Jan Savage, said, and I quote, the Scottish Government has not done enough to ensure that disabled people's human rights are fully realised and that the situation for pe disabled people overall in Scotland has not got better. That is a damning indictment. Now, I recognise that there is progress to come with the forthcoming incorporation bill on UNCRPD, but we must go further because those remarks speak, presiding officer, to a Scotland where a mental welfare commission is all too ready to appoint a curator to act to speak for a person who is deemed not to have the capacity to communicate when they actually do, when a small amount of effort could have put their voice at the centre of a process that could determine the rest of their lives. It speaks to a Scotland where our built environment and even new developments that are coming on stream present unnecessary, ill-thought-out physical barriers to our constituents with mobility difficulties. And it speaks to a Scotland where children who, during an episode of behavioural flare-up as a result of a neurodiverse condition, are still being restrained and subdued in ways that leave lasting trauma. Presiding officer, the government has real work to do in protecting disabled people's rights in our efforts to include them in employment and wider society. They are in part still failing the test set to all of us. It is a test that we understand full well because of debates that we have like these with regularity. I welcome the reopening of the Independent Living Fund. I welcome that we're having this debate, but we're still miles away from where we need to be. For example, when it comes to Social Security, and the uh, Minister referenced a lot of this in her remarks, uh, we know that those applying for adult disability payments are facing longer waits than they should be. In fact, they are facing longer waits than people who are still under the, D or were under the DWP system for personal independence payments. Presiding officer, when somebody who is in receipt of PIP and living in Scotland reports a change in circumstances, they are currently forced to wait three months to be moved over, and only then does Social Security Scotland start to work on that change in circumstances. If during that time their condition worsens they are in, and they are entitled to a higher rate, they are currently missing out. Now, I welcome the Minister's clarification on that, but there is still a massive cash flow issue for those families right now. Something that should happen at the touch of a button is simply taking months and denying disabled people the support they need it when they need it. This lays bare the Scottish Government's lack of foresight in removing the dedicated Social Security Minister to properly oversee this transition at its most critical juncture. This Government promised fairness, respect and dignity under the new arrangement. We all signed up to it. Instead, people are still being left to wait in uncertainty for months while a decision is being made. That's just not good enough for families across Scotland. Presiding officer, I'll close with these words. The writer and neurologist Oliver Sacks once wrote, I wish for a world that views disability, mental or physical, not as a hindrance, but as unique attributes that can be seen as powerful assets if given the right opportunity. Presiding officer, that is something we should all wish for. It is something that we as a society should strive for, and the realisation of the rights of people with disabilities is the only way to go about it. Thank you. Thank you, Mr Go Hamilton. Uh, we will now move to the open debate. I would remind all those members who wish to speak in the debate to please ensure that they have, in fact, pressed their request to speak button. And I call Kate Forbes, to be followed by Annie Wells. Ms Forbes. Uh, thank you, presiding officer. The aim captured in the government's motion for all disabled people is that they have freedom, dignity, choice and control over their lives. And I certainly would hope that all of us can unite in agreeing that these are uh, extremely laudable aims and objectives and actually uh, essential. And yet we can also use those objectives to test the reality for many disabled people in Scotland uh, today. 
And I wanted to start by making a key point, which I think is the, the source of everything else that we might debate today. And it is that human rights are based on the concept that everybody is equal. But true equality is rooted in the inherent dignity and worth of every human being, irrespective of who they are, how they contribute, where they live, or whether they conform to some sort of nonsensical, invented societal norm. And quite obviously, nobody can speak fully for others in this chamber. That's why it's so important that we hear directly from those who live with uh, disabilities themselves. They should be at the very heart of policy making and also of critiquing and feeding back on where we're falling short and where we're getting it right. But I am also delighted to speak for those who cannot speak. Uh, and that includes fellow citizens like my uncle. Born in the 1960s with Down syndrome, he wasn't expected to live for very long. Despite that, he'll be celebrating his 58th birthday in February next year. His MSP is John Swinney, and the first time I ever met uh, the Conservative MSP Alexander Stewart was at my uncle's 50th birthday party. It was probably one of the most uh, exciting birthday parties I had ever been at. My grandmother had to fight tooth and nail over decades to give him the very objectives that this debate calls for. She wanted him to have freedom. And to have freedom required education facilities to invest in teaching him, giving him skills, ensuring that his educational experience was the same, at the same standard and offered him the same dignity as uh, for those uh, who did not have a disability. And in equipping him with those skills, he would then go on to have greater freedom throughout life. She also cared about him having control over his life, to work in any job, to do sports, to pursue hobbies. He must be one of the biggest St. Johnson fans I have ever met, which was unfortunate when all of his family were required to join him for dinner at uh, the St. Johnson Stadium and uh, we would meet uh, various team members and not really knowing terribly much about St. Johnson at the time, I obviously have improved in my knowledge, it uh, meant um, you had to sort of uh, hide uh, your ignorance. But she also wanted him to have dignity, uh, not just in how he saw himself, but also in how other people treated him that he would be treated as an equal, not patronised. And so often, some of our discussions and debates about disabled people are full of that patronising language, as though we um, must uh, ensure that they are protected and so on, not realising that they have far more to teach us uh, and to equip us with um, than the other way round. Um, and lastly, choice to give... Yeah. Alex Go Hamilton. I'm uh, very grateful to Kate Forbes giving away. I very much enjoyed uh, listening to the story of Kate's uncle. Um, before she told us that story, she talked about giving people with disabilities a voice and then went on to describe the assumptions that society make and the patronising assumptions that society makes about people with disabilities. Does she recognise that one of the criticisms levelled at Scotland by the, UNC, the UN Committee on the Rights of People with Disabilities is that all too readily mental welfare commissions rush to appoint a curator when it seems just too difficult to hear the voice of the person at the heart of that, even when that is not impossible and with a bit more effort, we could hear their voice rather than giving that judgment over to somebody else. Kate Forbes. That's absolutely fair and right. And it's not just about listening to disabled people, but it's also having uh, the courage to introduce policies that reflect the diversity of people's experience and not treat disabled people as a homogenous whole. Um, and, and the last point was around choice over where to live. And he has lived in various places, sheltered uh, living in Perth, um, as well as residential care. And when I look back on uh, the narrative of his life, it is very clear that the level of fight, fighting and battling for these basic rights 
in this particular example did get easier over time as governments worked to ensure that policies reflected disabled people's human rights. We have made progress, but a few uh, weeks ago, I was meeting with some visually uh, impaired pupils in the Highlands who are being held back at school through a total lack of British Sign Language teachers. And that reminded me just how essential it is that at the youngest of ages, we do provide um, that choice, that freedom, by focusing on young people's education. And so, as I close, presiding officer, it, my point in this speech is that, of course, to reach those objectives requires more than sentiment and rhetoric once a year. It's about embedding that human rights approach in all of our work. And I think success will be reached when nobody feels the need to fight against the system to get what we believe should be rightfully theirs. Thank you, Ms Forbes. I, I would advise members that we do have quite a bit of time in hand uh, and therefore uh, interventions can easily be uh, taken without any reduction in speaking time. And with that, I call Annie Wells to be followed by Kevin Stewart. Ms Wells. Thank you, Deputy President Officer. I welcome the chance today to talk about the challenges that disabled people face in Scotland. There is much in the motion today that we can welcome. We agree that Scotland can and should be a world leader on protecting human rights. We recognise the incredible difficulty that many disabled people have faced during the pandemic and the global cost of living crisis. And we believe disabled people must be at the centre of decisions that affect them. We think there must be more attention on the disability employment gap and disability payment gap. There should be no discrimination in our economy or society and we must work harder to root that out. But many key human rights issues and, uh, issues and important issues for disabled people have been left out of the motion entirely. It paints an overly positive picture of this government's actions, and it glosses over many crucial aspects of this administration's policies. It neglects to mention terrible failings of this government. It wants to focus only on the limited amount of positive work, with no attention to the negatives. It ignores many issues that ought to receive much more focus of Scottish ministers, and that is what my party's amendment seeks to address. In the, in the motion itself, it says, secure a life of dignity for all, including the most marginalised and disadvantaged. Now, I fail to see how this government cannot mention Scotland's drug death crisis when that is part of the motion. This is an issue that is close to home for me, literally. In Springburn and communities like it across Glasgow, Dundee and Scotland, drug deaths have caused devastation. On this government's watch, drug deaths spiralled to the worst level in Europe, several times worse than anywhere else in the UK, and we lose more than 1,000 people each year to drugs in Scotland. And alcohol deaths too have hit record highs. We also lose more than 1,000 people each year to alcohol in Scotland. And those appalling statistics are not just for a year, but they have been at or close to record levels for many years. And for all that time, the government has failed to act with enough urgency and enough resources. By Nicola Sturgeon's own admission, the SNP took their eye off the ball. They neglected people's human rights, including the rights of some of the most vulnerable. The lack of action from the government has left whole families and communities in grief. Today, even now, years after the crisis begun, the SNP are not doing anywhere near enough. They play politics with drug and alcohol deaths. Instead of trying to save lives, they focus on creating division within, with the UK. And any discussion on human rights must include the SNP's horrendous failure to tackle the shameful numbers of lives lost to drug and alcohol addiction. But the motion overlooks and ignores some of our most vulnerable communities. But the drug and, al drug and alcohol deaths are not the only glaring omissions from today's motion. It, it cites the impact of the pandemic and the cost of living crisis on disabled people. The motion is right to do so. Disabled people have suffered far more than most from COVID and the global cost of living crisis. But where is the mention of human rights failings of the government during the pandemic? 
Yes, of course I will. Kate Forbes. I appreciate the, the member's contribution. Uh, I, I'm not sure that drug and alcohol death is, is specific to uh, the, the disabled uh, discussion that we're having right now. But in all seriousness, if we're going to improve the lives, improve um, services for, people, for disabled people, it takes all parties to come to the table uh, and make suggestions. What have the Tories done for disabled people in the last few years? Annie Wells. Balfour is putting forward, has lodged a disability commissioner bill. Um, we support the current adult disability payment motability descriptor to 50 metres, and we believe that all people with disabilities should be entitled to the Scottish Government's winter heating payment. We are coming to the table with things, but I think this is important when we're having a debate as well about human rights today. This is something that's very close to my heart as well. We're talking about the most marginalised and disadvantaged peoples. And I think people with drug and alcohol addiction ha are part of that, and we need to support them and show them human rights. Where, the, where the, is the mention of people who had life-saving treatment stopped? And where is the mention of the many vulnerable disabled people who were moved out of hospitals without proper respect to their wishes or their families' wishes? Where is the mention of the impact on transfer of COVID-positive patients to care homes? As my colleagues have said, and as more of them will continue to outline in greater detail, the motion today also neglects to mention the huge numbers of disabled people in Scotland's temporary accommodation. It doesn't bring up the need to deliver the coming home implementation recommendations for people with complex care needs. And it doesn't mention the delays and huge number of issues with Social Security to Scotland. It doesn't focus on the government's lack of action to tackle homelessness for disabled people. These are all glaring omissions of key issues that are well within this government's power. And too often the SNP want to praise for the limited amounts that they have done while deflecting all criticism for all the things they have failed to achieve. But in conclusion, presiding officer, today's debate is welcome, but is a missed opportunity to really address key issues facing disabled people and vital elements of human rights law in Scotland. The government has brought forward a motion that neglects to mention that the many instances of failings that disabled people have felt at the hands of this government. It ignores so many human rights issues in Scotland that deserve to be debated in this parliament. So while we agree on much of the positives in the motion, we are disappointed that it merely seeks to congratulate the government instead of tackling serious, taking a serious look at actions and how it could improve. Thank you, President Officer. Thank you, Ms. Wells. And I now call Kevin Stewart to be followed by Pam Duncan Glancy. Mr. Stewart. Uh, thank you very much, uh, President Officer. Uh, worldwide, over a billion people are disabled. In Scotland, it's well over a million. Uh, that's a quarter of our population whose day to day activities are limited by disability or a long term health problem. That's double the worldwide average, but that is actually something to be celebrated. That's hundreds of thousands of children uh, born with disabilities who a few generations ago wouldn't have, have made it but have. That's uh, hundreds of thousands of adults who've suffered injury or disease who a few generations ago wouldn't have made it but have. And that's hundreds of thousands of older adults who would have died of heart disease, stroke or cancer a few generations ago but who are still here. Uh, and this increase in disability as time goes by um, is all too clear in the numbers. 11% of children are disabled, but that doubles to 23% for working age adults. By pension age, it doubles again to 46%. And by the time you hit 80, it's over 60%. Uh, many often think uh, uh, about disability as a, a them and us issue, but it's not. Disability could happen to any of us. Uh, disability isn't an exclusive club. You can join it any day, and eventually, most of us will. And for many of us, uh, it's more uh, of a question of how many years uh, that we'll spend uh, disabled and how many of those years we'll spend able-bodied. During your disabled years, do you want to make a, a meaningful and productive contribution to society? Half of disabled people don't have employment, even though uh, many, many folk want to work. During your disabled years, do you want to be treated with dignity and respect? 
the half of disabled people who are employed are, are twice as likely to face discrimination, harassment and bullying in the workplace. And during your disabled years, do you want to be warm and well fed? Half of disabled people can't afford their heating and three quarters of households who use a food bank have a disabled family member. We all know what we want for ourselves now and in our futures, but what we should be doing is looking to how to improve the lives for today's disabled people and getting it right for all in the future. Now, the upcoming Human Rights Bill, uh, which will include disability rights and will seek to incorporate the UN Convention of the Rights of Persons with Disabilities into Scots law, is a good thing. This is a vital and urgent step uh, shown by the comments of the UN's Special Rapporteur, who said that the UK is failing its international obligations on fundamental economic and social rights. And while we are limited by uh, the failing UK framework, we must do all that we can within the limits of devolution. Social security is a human right. It is here for all of us, or should be here for all of us, should we need it. Uh, and disabled people should have access to the support that they need to lead full and independent lives. Uh, and while the Scottish Government, the Scottish Parliament, can't shield disabled people totally from the UK uh, Government's plans to cut benefits by £4 billion. Uh, things like the Adult Social Disability Payment, the Child Disability Payment and the Carer Support Payment from Social Security Scotland are making a real difference. Uh, we also need to focus our, our efforts on those who need it the most. 41% of children living in poverty uh, come from a household uh, with a disabled family member. The Scottish Child Payment uh, provides targeted help to these families. The Independent Living Fund provides focused support for young adults making the transition from childhood to adulthood. This fund, since opening, has delivered £12 million pounds via 6,500 transition fund grants to more than 5,000 young disabled people. Uh, and it's not just about funding. We need a joined up system uh, and the Scottish Government will soon publish the first national transitions to adulthood strategy, making the transition journey a smoother and more positive one. We have heard in this debate about listening to the voices of lived experience. Uh, and that is something that we must all do. Uh, as a minister, uh, I did so uh, and spent uh, a lot of time listening to disabled people, hearing about the difficulties that they faced and what they needed to make their lives better. And I'm quite sure um, that Ms Roddick is doing exactly uh, the same. Now, President Officer, I want independence for my country, but I also want all Scots to be able to lead independent lives, including all of our disabled citizens. We must make their independence a reality. Thank you, President Officer. Thank you, Mr Stewart. And I call Pam Duncan Glancy to be followed by Karen Adam and Ms Duncan Glancy is joining us online. Thank you, Presiding Officer. The Scottish Parliament rightly always recognises International Day of Disabled People, and we should be very proud of that. But this year has a marked and significant change for two reasons. Firstly, for the first time, this day of recognition is not just celebrated as a members' debate, but instead as a full government debate. And I want to put on record my thanks to the government for bringing it forward and ensuring that this parliament has a full afternoon to address the issues of key importance, not just to disabled people, but to Scotland. The significance of doing so cannot be understated. And secondly, because last weekend we held the first ever summit celebrating International Day of Disabled People here in this chamber. It was an absolute privilege to look out to the benches and see them full to the brim with disabled people, their organisations and their allies, with many more joining online. It was an incredibly special moment and I cannot express my thanks enough 
to my colleague Jeremy Balfour, the presiding officers and their team, and the staff of this parliament for making it happen and ensuring it was a warm, welcoming and celebratory event that everyone enjoyed. And I've always said that there is, should be nothing about us without us. Indeed, we've heard it this afternoon. And I fought to make sure that's the case during my time in this parliament. The event made it clear to the disability movement and that this place belongs to them too, our parliament belongs to them too. And I hope that in years to come, we'll see more of that. Colleagues, the International Day of Disabled People was first declared back in 1992, when I was just 11, just over 30 years later, and the world has changed, in some ways, quite significantly. Barriers, structural ones, have been torn down by legislative change. And I want to take a moment to recognise the work of my party in this context, and specifically the Labour government of the early 2000s, which introduced working tax credits to support disabled people to get back to work, the Equality Act, which enshrined our rights to be treated equally in domestic legislation, and of course, signing us up to the United Nations Convention on the Rights of Disabled People. The Scottish Government too has made progress, including in the Self-Directed Support Act, which gave us a right to direct our own care in 2013. Reopening of the ILF, although it has taken too long to do so, and signing up to the definition of independent living that recognises that living independently is not about living on your own or fending for yourself. It's about having the rights to practical assistance and support to lead an ordinary or indeed extraordinary life. Those changes have been life changing for disabled people. And I say that from my own lived experience as well as from what I've heard from the movement. But the job is not yet done. Too many barriers still exist and there is much more work to do. There is never time to be complacent or self-congratulatory. Disabled people are still disproportionately more likely to be in poverty, have lower incomes but higher living costs. And the consequences of not being able to make ends meet can be life limiting, not just threatening our right to survive, but uh, to thrive, but to survive. And it's becoming increasingly harder for disabled people to pay for care that they rely on too. In April this year, the Glasgow City Health and Social Care Partnership hiked up charges for people requiring non-residential social care, with the Govan Law Centre estimating that some people could, pay, could face a 65% increase. One woman from Glasgow said to researchers that, I always feel like Damocles' sword is above my head, as my care plan has not been reassessed since July 22, and I've had many care changes. My care contribution has been increased by £42 a week, but my increase with working tax credit and PIP is only £18.93 a week. I already cut my budget in half because of utility bills. Now I'm very stressed. This should not be happening, least of all in a Scotland that the government said years ago would end non-residential charges. And presiding officer, inaccessible transport means we can't move freely around either. Inaccessible transport means we often have to rely on cars or taxis instead, putting ourselves significantly out of pocket. And even where we can afford it, taxis and cars are becoming more of a struggle. Members will have heard me talk about concerns from Glasgow where disabled people feel left behind in the journey to net zero. The subway is not accessible for wheelchair users. Buses can only take one wheelchair or pram at a time. And train travel requires a lot of forward planning. Now, as a result of a hastily implemented emission zone in the city, black cabs that we turn to instead are now slowly disappearing from the streets. And it's not just our freedom of movement and world travelling that's a problem. There's a lack of properly accessible, affordable homes too. These challenges we face as a group have been called a human catastrophe by the UN Committee on the UNCRPD. And the Scottish Human Rights Commission has warned that the Scottish Government has not done enough to realise disabled people's human rights. All of us in this chamber and other chambers should heed that today, tomorrow and every day thereafter. Against this backdrop, we in these benches are deeply concerned that disabled people's organisations believe that the gap in political leadership have led to disabled people feeling deprioritised and dehumanised at a time when they should be a focus of our government. It's why I don't think the government's motion today goes far enough in recognising the challenges faced. And this backdrop is also why I make no apologies for being disappointed that Fahey hasn't been implemented, frustrated at delays to the immediate priorities plan, which are no longer immediate, they're overdue, and angry that the government has not yet ended non-residential charges. It doesn't have to be this way. With bold and swift action, we can make Scotland the land of opportunity for disabled people. I know it can be. That starts in school, yet of course we're failing large numbers of disabled pupils. More than a third of pupils in Scotland identify as having an additional support need, yet ASN support's in decline. We need to fix that, and we need to ensure children have the support they need to thrive and reach their full potential. 
That also means we have to help them properly prepare to leave education. And we heard how badly we're failing them during the debate on my transitions bill last month. Now, I can't express my disappointment that the government and others chose not to support that bill and give all young disabled people a, a right to a transitions plan. But I said then, and I will reiterate it now, I'll not let the issue be forgotten. I'll continue to hold the feet to the fire on this, and I won't stop fighting for change until we make a difference. And it's on that note, presiding officer, that I'd like to close. Despite all of the negative odds, over the last 30 years, disabled people and our allies have shifted the dial. We've pushed open doors and we've changed laws when governments have been bold enough to do so. Sometimes the fight can feel endless. Our achievements come despite the challenges. The wins have come because we've refused to give up. We will keep pushing forward for our goal of human rights and transformation. And we in this place have to have the courage and ambition to stand beside them. So I want to end with a message to disabled people right across Scotland. Be proud, be vocal, you have rights, keep fighting. It might take time, it will take effort, and you can be sure it will take a lot of hard graft. But I know that our movement is not scared of that. And I promise that for as long as I am in this place, I and my party, for you, your fight will be our fight. There will be nothing about us without us. Thank you. Thank you, Ms Duncan Clancy. And we, uh, I now call Karen Adam to be followed by Martin Whitfield. Ms Adam. Thank you, President Officer, and it's a privilege to be able to talk on this subject today. It's no secret to this chamber that campaigning for human rights is a deep passion of mine, mostly because of the experiences that I've had throughout my own life and in the lives of those that I love. And I honestly have to pinch myself some days in the knowledge that I have the privilege of being a member of the Human Rights, Equalities and Civil Justice Committee, a role which I deeply appreciate having. I wholeheartedly support this motion and in particular the importance to understand the dire consequences the COVID-19 pandemic and the cost of living crisis have had and continue to have on human rights for all of us. But the impact is exceptionally significant on the lives of those living with disabilities. Therefore, the reopening of the Independent Living Fund, along with the commitment to develop and implement an immediate priorities plan for disabled people, marks a significant step forward. And it's heartening to see the Scottish Government taking concrete actions to address these pressing issues, reinforcing our ambition to lead the world in human rights realisation. The challenges faced by people with disabilities are not just financial, they are societal. They affect access to public services, general mobility and connectivity, community cohesion, and consequently, the basic human interactions we need for our health and well-being. It is a challenge which, without adequate support, can leave a person feeling isolated and abandoned in a world in which they should feel belonging. There is one aspect of this motion which resonates with me in particular, and it's the acknowledgement of the need for social and cultural rights for people with disabilities. As the Parliament knows, my father is deaf, and this has shaped my understanding of specific aspects needed for a whole person approach to disabilities. I was raised alongside deaf children and CODAs, children of deaf adults like myself. And I have to agree with my colleague Kate Forbes in her comments on dignity and having less um, patronising attitudes. As an interpreter for my father over the years, it's been enlightening and not in a great way when um, faced with ignorance in many aspects of society. I was surrounded by a community which was visually vibrant and expressive. And to paint a picture of the Deaf Club in Aberdeen, it was a place of drama clubs, sports clubs. It was held in an incredible building with shelves of trophies and pictures of successes adorning the walls. There was an integrated church and a large kitchen which was used regularly for events, snooker tables, bowling mats, a stage in a hall where signing musical shows and comedy shows were held and performed by deaf people and hearing people alike. Deaf people from all over the UK would come to visit and participate in these events. And I particularly loved meeting deaf Santa there one year as a wee girl. This was a haven for deaf people where they weren't just supported. They were given the tools to support themselves and they ran with it. It was a thriving community with a beautiful language. Sadly, this club had to close its doors over a decade ago. And I hope that we can realise the importance of community spaces like this, that inclusion in the wider world is important, but equally so is ensuring safe spaces where communities can gather and organise. 
The beautiful language I speak of, presiding officer, BSL, was one my dad would be physically punished for using when he was a wee boy in the 1950s. And he was forced to conform to the idealised version of an able-bodied person, a language which his parents and peers supported him to learn and watched him thrive. Often being one of the funniest actors in the comedy shows, according to me, and I often think of what it must have been like for my wee dad back in the 50s. And, into my, and with my interactions with deaf charities and stakeholders, the conversation often revolves around the need for early and effective support for deaf children. Ensuring that these children have access to the necessary language and communication skills is crucial for the development of future success. This aligns with the broader goal of disability equality, where equal opportunities are provided to all children, regardless of their abilities. Today's motion, with its emphasis on equality of opportunity and inclusion of social and cultural rights, is a step towards bridging the gap between the disabled and the able-bodied by incorporating international human rights conventions into Scots law, particularly those recognising sign languages and deaf culture, we are making our society more inclusive and richer. As we move forward, it's crucial that we continue to engage with and listen to the disabled community. Their insights and expertise are invaluable in shaping policies that truly address their needs and aspirations. This approach ensures that our efforts are not just top-down, but informed by those who are directly impacted by our decision. Enshrining these rights will not only make our society and culture more accessible, but altogether richer from the inclusion of deaf people, of people with experiences different to our own, from which we can learn and appreciate. And I'm sure that all of us in this chamber have a keen desire to be a part of the solutions for improving the lives of disabled folk in Scotland. And it's certainly one of my own core aspirations for being here. In closing, President Officer, I'm proud to support this motion and the principles it stands for by celebrating disability equality and human rights. We are not just complying with international standards, we are working towards a society where every individual is valued, respected and given the opportunity to thrive. This motion is a testament to our commitment to creating a Scotland that is inclusive, just and equitable for all. Most important of all, President Officer, realising these rights will help deliver dignity for all those living with disabilities in Scotland. After all, my childhood wasn't impaired by having a deaf father. It was enriched, and I hope that that enrichment can be felt across Scotland and beyond. Thank you. Thank you, Ms Adam. I now call Martin Whitfield to be followed by Claire Hawkins.